So yeah, the title of this talk is Mapping Neurotransmitter Receptors to the Connectivity and Dynamics of the Human Neocortex. Um, so just to start with uh, what these receptors are, so receptors are these proteins that are embedded within the cell membrane, a neurotransmitter might bind to it, causing it to open or change configuration in some way, and there's this flow of ions across the cell membrane. This specific receptor is inotropic, and so it acts on a faster time scale. There's another version, which is metabotropic. It's usually coupled to another protein, often the G protein. It doesn't actually look like a G. Um, when the neurotransmitter binds to it, it activates this G protein that kicks off a signaling cascade. You get the same effect. Some channel downstream will open up, have, allow this flow of ions. So again, this is metabotropic and acts on a slower time scale. Um, in both of these cases, so when the neurotransmitter receptor binds, it can cause the flow of ions to, be, to come into the cell or out of the cell, and it can also cause the receptor to open or close. But uh, the story is the same in all these different cases. The neurotransmitter binds to the neurotransmitter receptor, and then there's a change in the electrical poten potential within the cell because these charged ions, the concentration of these charged ions um, inside the cell changes. And as we know, this uh, electrical potential inside the cell uh, governs an action potential, whether this neuron is going to fire an action potential. And so because of that, these receptors are key modulators of um, the firing rate of the cell. And if we just zoom out a little bit, the um, firing rate of this neuron is, is directly connected to whether the neuron is going to synapse onto another neuron and also the dynamics of the neuron. And so because of that, they are key modulators of firing rate, but also of brain connectivity and dynamics. So the idea of this project was to zoom out from this kind of one receptor zone and to look at across the cortex. Can we see this relationship between receptor distributions and brain connectivity and dynamics? So to that, we need data. So this has been done before. There's this data set from Nicola Palomero, Gallagher, and Carl Zillis, where they collected auto radio, audio radiographs for 15 different neurotransmitter receptors in three laminar layers across 44 cytoarchitectonically defined regions in the left hemisphere. So that's what you're seeing there on the left. Um, and they find that these receptor distributions uh, vary. You know, they're heterogeneous across the cortex. Another group, a couple years later, took that same data because it is openly available. Um, found the principal axis of variation and related this to certain molecular attributes like the receptor diversity, excitatory inhibitory ratios, inotropic and hypertrophic ratios. And so because this data is available, I will be using it, but I'll be using it as my replication data set because it doesn't have the full coverage across the cortex. So instead, what I did was I contacted a bunch of people and started collecting a lot of pet data. So full disclosure, I did not collect any of this pet data myself. And they're coming from different groups um, different acquisition pro protocols, but because of that, we z-score all of the tracer maps, and they are following the best practice guidelines for each radio ligand separately. So in the end, we collected a whole bunch of these PET tracers in um, generally young, but all healthy controls, and we have a total of 18 unique neurotransmitter receptors, receptor binding sites, and transporters um, across nine different neurotransmitter systems. So you can see those right here, so serotonin, acetylcholine, dopamine, etc. And from more than 1,200 healthy controls. So it's a pretty big data set. And I just want to shout out that we're actually going to be making this data, I mean, given consent from all the people that shared it with us, of course, we will be making it available in a toolbox called NeuroMaps that is coming out soon um, that already has a lot of different brain maps, like, for example, PC1 gene expression, um, metabolism markers, things like that. Uh, yeah, so just to give you an idea of what this data set looks like, we take all of these PET tracers, we parcelate them into a certain parcellation, and then we collate them as um, brain regions by receptors. And so I'll just show you, this is the mean receptor density across brain regions. So it is heterogeneous and it is enriched in certain brain regions where um, every brain region is representing. So this would be the average across these densities of all 18 receptors. Um, and we can do some more things with this data set, for example, correlating them across the receptors themselves. So this would be um, the cortical distribution of one receptor correlated to all other receptors and then for each receptor. And you can see they're generally positively correlated to one another, but there is some uh, variability there. Um, the analogous thing to do would be to correlate the brain regions to one another. So this is the correlation between the receptor fingerprint and every pair of brain regions. Um, this indexes how, so how similar of a uh, receptor fingerprint every pair of brain regions has, but that's kind of an, an, a, way, a way of estimating whether two brain regions would respond similarly to the same neural signal. Because you can think of these receptors as like ears on the, on the neuron. And so if you have a neural signal and they have similar, two different brain regions are, are composed of similar receptor distributions or receptor kind of cell ears, then they would probably be responding similarly to the same signal. And this receptor similarity matrix is approximately normally distributed. So, I have three kind of main um, results or questions that I'm going to be addressing in this talk. 
first one is how do these receptor densities relate to structure, structural and functional connectivity? Second one is related to brain dynamics. And um, the third one is related to gene expression. So I think I kind of motivated the first two with my intro about these receptors being key in, in dynamics and connectivity. Um, I just want to bring up gene expression because there's been like a lot of work recently that um, has been using gene expression for specific neurotransmitter receptors as a proxy for receptors, but we don't actually know how associated they are, these gene expression, um, so gene transcription and the actual protein density. Um, so we did kind of a large scale, large scale analysis of that, which I'll show you. So to start, uh, how are receptor densities related to structural and functional connectivity? So I'll start with the structure. So for that, we're going to be looking at the structural connectome. So that's coming from diffusion-weighted MRI, just an estimate of whether two brain regions are, are physically connected. Um, and then I'm comparing this to that receptor similarity matrix. So again, that's the correlation between the receptor fingerprints of every pair of brain regions. And we ask like, some like really simple questions. So for example, are brain regions that are structurally connected more likely to have more similar receptor fingerprints? And we find that that is the case. Um, and that's kind of interesting and maybe not so surprising because if you have similar uh, receptor distributions or receptor fingerprints at the brain region, then you're probably uh, firing at a, a similarly and therefore synapsing with one another. And we also find this negative exponential trend between receptor similarity and the distance between ever two brain regions. So two brain regions that are close together are more likely to have similar receptor fingerprints and two brain regions that are far apart are more likely to have different receptor fingerprints. And this is a property that has been shown for many things like gene co-expression, temporal similarity, functional connectivity, et cetera. And so um, it kind of makes sense that receptors should be organized according to similar organizational principles of the brain. So the second part of this was the functional connectivity. So really analogously, now we're looking at the functional connectome. So those are Pearson's correlations between the fMRI old time series between every pair of regions. And we ask whether brain regions that are within the same um, resting state networks are more likely to show greater receptor similarity than brain regions that are between um, resting state networks. And we find that that is the case again. And we also find that receptor similarity is correlated with functional connectivity after we regress distance out of both of them. Um, so that's kind of interesting also because if you have similar receptor distributions, it makes sense that you would be firing similarly and therefore kind of have similar functional outputs and, and then be contributing to similar functional networks, but kind of doing similar, um, yeah, doing similar things. So that was the first question. The second one is about neural dynamics. So I kind of already touched on neural dynamics with the um, functional connectivity, but I'm going to take it a step further and look at MEG data. So this is um, MEG data coming from the Human Connectome Project. And um, we uh, looked at the power distributions of six different frequency bands across the brain. And then we just fit multilinear regression models between the receptors as input variables brain regions as observations, and then each of these power band distributions as the output variable. So that would be six models total, so one for each power band. I'm predicting this um, power distribution for all the different frequencies from receptor distributions. And the first thing you see is that the fit is high. So that's interesting because it kind of suggests that there is this um, relationship between these uh, receptor distributions and how they relate to one another and um, fast acting dynamic, these neural oscillations, which is the meg power. And then we apply dominance analysis to this model. And dominance analysis is a technique that takes this fit, so the adjusted R squared, and it distributes it to different in input variables. So you can think of, um, so the sum across every uh, row here would give you, of the sum of the dominance across every row would give you the final adjusted R squared. So you can kind of think of this as um, explaining which receptors, which input variables are most dominant, most mostly contributing to this fit between uh, dynamics and receptor distributions. And we, we see some interesting trends here. For example, we find that um, this pain-related mu opioid receptor is kind of linked to theta and alpha bands, and theta and alpha bands have been related to pain before. And also that we have this ionotropic receptor that shows up, um, our only ionotropic receptor. Um, oh, sorry, that's not true anymore. It used to be the only one, and then we got more data. <laughs> but we have an ionotropic receptor here that is um, uh, especially implicated in the fast oscillations. So for example, these two, the low gamma and the high gamma, so these are the fastest frequencies. Um, and we have our GABA-A receptor being especially dominant towards that. And that's kind of interesting. And I just want to point out, so we replicate everything in the autoradiography data set, and I'm not going to show it here because of the interest of time, but um, we do replicate this result and we find in the autoradiography data set, which has a bigger um, collection of inotropic versus metabotropic receptors, that these especially excitatory inotropic receptors are really um, dominant towards neural oscillations, which of course are, are fast acting um, dynamics. And then the final thing I want to show you is this relationship with gene expression. Now, this is a really 
overwhelming slide and that's kind of on purpose. Um, what I'm showing here is the correlation between the gene that is corresponding to each receptor. And so for most metabotropic receptors, that's just, there's one gene that, that kind of codes for the whole receptor, but for inotropic receptor, it gets a bit more complicated and I'm not showing all the subunits, but we do do the analysis for all the subunits. And um, what you should take away is all the blue scatter plots are uh, relationships that are not significant, so there's no correlation. And all the yellow scatter plots are those that where there is a significant correlation. So this is kind of um, shocking, I guess, but also like interesting that um, in most cases, we cannot use gene expression as a proxy for receptor distribution. So in most cases, the microarray gene transcription is coming from the Allen human brain atlas. This is not correlated to the density of the protein both in PET data sets and other radiography data sets. Now, of course, there are exceptions. So for example, 5-H21A is nicely correlated in the PET data sets, nicely correlated in the auto radiography data set. There seems to be a close relationship with its gene. And some other ones like D2, um, CB1, which is an endocannabinoid receptor, um, MOR, which is an opioid receptor, and um, acetylcholine receptor. But you know that's just a handful compared to a lot of other receptors. And so, sorry, and a lot of other genes. So the takeaway here is that we can generally not use Gene expression, gene expression as a proxy for PET data. And since this data will hopefully be available very soon, you can use that PET data instead. So to summarize, I'll just quickly wrap up. Um, we find that these neurotransmitter receptors and transporters, transporters are organized according to the structural and functional architectures of the human brain. So I showed that with the diffusion-weighted MRI structural connectome and the um, fMRI bold functional connectome. And then we've, I showed you that neurotransmitter receptors, especially anotropic receptors, shape neural dynamics. So I showed you that with the MEG results. And finally, that microarray gene expression can generally not be used as a proxy for neurotransmitter receptor densities, except in some very special cases. So with that, I will finish up. So thanks to my lab, my supervisor, Braslav Misic, um, collaborator, collaborators, and funding. Yes, thanks. Great, and thank you very much for uh, a chock full talk and lots to think about. And again, very, very provocative. Uh, is there uh, one question maybe from audience? And I see we've been having a, a lot of good luck with, with chat. So I'm going to wait a, a few seconds, but then we would go to uh, be sure to check your, your chat and I'm sure there'll be a, a, a interaction. Um, that's really great work with uh, receptor density and provocative, a uh, uh, good lesson that we have to be uh, humble in terms of, uh, uh, there is one question from uh, Neville. Do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Uh, just a very like open-ended question, I guess, but uh, why do you actually think that genetics uh, or genetic factors would be so like, like have such little predictive factor for the neurotransmitter distribution? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, a lot of stuff, I'm actually honestly a little bit surprised that mm -hmm. we expect that there should be such a close relationship because there's so many steps between the two, right? First, you need to get gene. This is just like, like Alan Human Brain Atlas, that's just gene transcription, right? So, we're not even talking about whether this mRNA is getting translated or all the bugs that happen there. Then, we need to have this functional protein make it to the exterior of the cell. It needs to be stuffed into the membrane without errors. And in the case of uh, receptors that have multiple sub subunits, you need to put all the subunits together. So there's quite a few, you know what I mean? There's quite a few steps mm -hmm. between one and the other. So that's one thing. Another thing, which is not exclusive, is that this PET data and the gene expression data, these are all coming from different individuals. And so it could be the case that for receptors and, and um, gene expression that is very stable across individuals, so there's low variability across participants, that they would show a close correspondence. But other um, receptor densities or gene expression that show high variability between people. So for example, in the Allen Human Brain Atlas, they have this measure of differential stability and that kind of indexes whether a gene is um, stable across the six donors. And if it's not, well, then it's not very, very, it is highly variable. It's not very stable across different people. And because of that, maybe we probably wouldn't expect it to be um, so stable in terms of the receptor density as well. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's very interesting. I also wonder if it could be development. So if you were doing it at an earlier stage, you'd have more stability. But I think we do mm -hmm. need to, to move on. Th thank you very much. Uh...